Hey, 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 so, yay, I'm, Jeffrey's back, how are you doing? It was a good trip, you know, um, yeah. got to see some, some family and friends that I haven't seen in a, in a hot minute, so it was, you, it was really great, like, you, you getting did the to, tour. I, I did a very flying tour, uh, <laughs> <clears throat> I mean, I put on 1,700 miles in the course of five days, so. Wow, wow, I'm glad the gas prices were lower so you could make that trip. No, uh, they were not that much lower. <laughs> That's a shame. But you got your guitar? Uh, my amp. I got my amp. Oh, you got your amp. All right. Okay. Yep. My guitars are with me. I, I just didn't have my professional amp. And, of course, what was really funny is just that, you know, I, I get it in and I get it all set up. And kids were all of a sudden like, holy shit, you actually used to play. I'm like, yeah, I've been, <laughs> I, have, I wasn't joking about this. Like, I have a professional setup. Right. People don't remember who we were if they never met us, right? Right. That's so you interesting. Know. I want to say thank you to the guys at Audio Pong for filling in with for you. <laughs> Ooh. I'm, obviously, I was super prepared for today. I just drank my coffee and it went down the right way. But Perfect. yeah, thank you to Zach and Marco for filling in. You know, I appreciate that. There were some great episodes, but we did miss you. That's for sure. Yeah, you know, it was nice to get away for a minute. I um, bet. Definitely, definitely going to be a lot going on for me here over the next few weeks, maybe month, but you know, that's just the way that it is. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You have a full life. I have a very full life, but mm -hmm. that's all right. You know, got the kids going back to school. Unfortunately, we're down another person at work again. Mm -hmm. We got, you know, a whole bunch of different things happening at work, you know, just lots, lots, lots happening. So oh, wow. how do you deal with that? Do you itemize it in your head? Do you just kind of lump it up and do it as it comes like a pinball? Like, how do you handle all that stuff at once? Um, I usually have like a notepad next to me. Um, I, I kind of have two systems. So one is like my emails. You know, mm. I, I'll go through. It's like if, if, if I have an email thread that needs me to do something, respond to something, I'll keep that um, unread until... Uh, I get it done. Ah, okay. And then, and then other things that pop up that aren't in emails, I have written down on a notepad next to me and I go through and I, you know, I take down my notes and then as I need to, mm. because I get stuff done, then it's, you know, I move on to the next thing. So I always, I always kept a list of what I did at work. And that way, when the boss would be like, what did you do all day? I could just hand him my note and say, between this time and this time, I swept. Between this time and this time, I did that. And it helped me because every once in a while, I would put stupid things on the list to make it fill out to make myself feel better. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. But when it's crazy, it's crazy. And that's something everybody's trying to deal with. I didn't even know what I didn't even know what to put in my note because this week was so homogenous but so crazy at the same time, you know what I mean? Oh and yeah. The past 2 weeks we went from like student debt to like Biden calling mega fas fascists and and Sarah Palin losing and Jacksonville losing its water and it was like I don't even know where to go this week, you know? It's crazy. Well, I think I think ultimately it kind of it uh how do I put it? <clears throat> unfortunately there were some things called out onto the carpet that needed to be called out there are some things that went to that shit the bed that you know needed to needed to be highlighted yeah um you know i don't know what to tell people you know critical infrastructure you know when you think about it that's you know your water sewer that's your electrical that's your food lines that's yeah. you, you, most people don't ever really think about it you know and and it's a really good read but the U.S. has, I think, what is it, 16 critical infrastructures is, is how they have it broken down. Wow. And then there's subsection, subsectors of that. Okay. And, and when you look at, you know, just how quickly an area can fall apart, all you have to do is, you know, this is, these are ongoing assessments that the United States has done, you know, essentially since about the Second World War, like starting around the Eisenhower period. Because, you know, uh, for Eisenhower, being a military person, you know, lo logistics and supply is what wins a war. And for him, moving into the fight against communism, you know, it, we had to have, quote unquote, supply lines throughout the country that, you know, were going to be successful in fighting communism. We always, yeah. had that, 
we always had that concern that Russia would be invading the country. Because at the time, they were the only other country capable of potentially doing anything. Now, granted, our armed forces were far bigger and far superior. I mean, yeah. especially after know the that. war. We didn't know that. <laughs> well, we didn't We didn't fully know it. But we didn't, you know, the, the thinking at the time was we weren't going to leave anything to chance. Correct. I like that. Thank God. You know, so we had to develop systems of identifying our quote-unquote supply lines you know what what would cause the country to fall apart if x happened right you know and be able to and and be able to break it down one of the things that i got published on was a risk assessment of uh, the agriculture uh, critical uh, the food sector um, and oil and gas and how um the the inner workings of some of these critical infrastructures can tend to be at odds with each other so for example in my paper that got published what i talked about was how you know in the fight against climate change you know the idea that you know we, what we need to be doing is advancing as you know our, our technologies as fast as possible um, in order to avert climate catastrophes but at the same time you had to acknowledge the risk that uh with with agriculture being what it is relying on heavy equipment mm. i mean it's it, you know it's a heavy equipment industry is what it is in, yeah. a, in a lot of aspects but you don't you don't have number one you know significant hybrid technologies at least you know you, you were only starting to like when i published my paper you were only starting to see hybrid technology enter the agricultural industry right water systems and such like that well uh, no i'm talking even you know, just from the oil and gas perspective so like ah. so uh like diesel electric hybrids um for example because everything you know everything out there runs on diesel you mm. know you have to have the the power you look at the mining industry it's diesel electric you look at the the locomotive industry it's diesel electric you look at any number of different industries out there that rely on heavy machinery it's diesel electric but agriculture has been one that is significantly lagged behind in that so uh, you only just started to see that you know by figuring out how to number one you know reduce consumption of you know these fuels you would find yeah. that the average you know what should be the average price of your food would drop because the price of your inputs would be less affected by wild swings in prices you know thanks to things like i mean you know a russian invasion of ukraine or you know iran being sanctioned and their oil supply being taken offline like you think about it logistically speaking if russia iran and venezuela were allowed to sell their oil on the market we would you would watch the price of oil bottom out overnight and the saudis oh, yeah. would cut back but then the saudis after a, you know a short period of time would find themselves in a world of hurt and they'd start pumping again so you'd watch the price bottom out even further that's right you know and because that America happened being, that happened exactly. a year or two ago mm -hmm. and so i mean even you you even saw that in 2016 after the nuclear deal was reached the, that was the last time prices were as low as they ever were you know because you know iran suddenly flooded the market with oil oh. that they had been desperately needing to do and you saw prices like out here the average price the average cost of a gallon of premium was like 230 something which i hadn't seen since i was a kid <laughs> so yeah. You know, it's it's one of those things where, like, what most people have to realize is, is that the scarcity of oil right now is an artificial scarcity. It's mm -hmm. not that it's not that we don't have the ability to supply it. It's that it's being you know sanctioned into uh, being removed from markets. Agreed. But back to the point of agriculture. Yeah. That because if you I don't. Wanna, I just want to say for a second. I just learned this week that agriculture. That, that community feels like they're attacked for climate change. And I found that fascinating because mm -hmm. I think agriculture is the opposite of that. It's well, that's the thing is, is that you you're putting something into the ground that is a car, a carbon consumer. Like, right. And, and realistically speaking, there was, I had made some references to this in my paper. Um, that you get better wheat crops, for example, when there is a higher carbon content in the air. 
fun fact. The problem is, is, is that when the, the higher the carbon content, the hotter it gets, the hotter it gets, the more extremes you experience. So it's kind of like a, it's, it's, it's a wash. You might get a bigger crop, but if it's dry and your crops burn to the fucking ground because you haven't gotten any rain in 90 days right. or they, or your crops wither away because they haven't gotten any rain in 90 days, or you get severe storms that knock them to the ground and they never get to develop that quote unquote benefit never gets realized. Right. And so I went into all of this in this paper and uh, you know, basically what it boiled down to was diversification was the answer, which is why it's something I talk about consistently. It says that in crops or area. Uh, in, in, so in number one in crops, number two in area, number three in, in uh, your fuel source, mm. because realistically speaking, like the technology is not there to have electric combines. It's just not. Right. The so amount that's, that's of... where they're saying that they feel the attacked is because of exactly. these, the machinery and the cows, right? Cows fart and machinery is made. Uh, okay. I so, just think one harvester for a hundred acres isn't as bad as like a turnpike in LA. You know what I mean? Well, I'll send you my paper, but I actually did the math on at the time what our family farm would have generated in terms of carbon. Nice. And it's it's very significant. And the thing is, is that what most people don't realize is, you know, we don't have an option. If you want of right. the average farmer to feed that many people you have to use the technology where it currently stands and based on where the technology currently stands it produces a lot a lot of carbon the only way that you would potentially be able to go back you know go backwards is is that you'd have to start using animal power you know right. and then you got that whole issue again and you can't you can't farm that much with, no. you know that's that's why we have more technology and so yeah farmers do feel attacked for climate change but the reality is is that the industry hasn't number one supplied them with a suitable alternative and and number two um ag sciences typically tend to lag behind everywhere else because everybody hmm. you you have a couple of different you have a couple of different factors in that you know number one you know you've got the whole like gmo scare oh my god you know right. uh, it's not natural <laughs> I mean, realistically, the corn you consume isn't natural. The soybeans you consume isn't natural. The tomatoes you eat aren't natural. They're the product of crossbreeding. It's just that genetically, mm -hmm. we figured out how to do it faster. Yeah. Um, and then on top of that, uh, you know, we typically don't let science get to do the science in the ag industry. It's not, you know, uh, it, it's, it's starting to catch up. But it's not as it's not as prominent as say like the pharmaceutical industry or right. technology industry. And it's more based on crop development than crop harvesting, I would say. Um, exactly. And that's and that's just it, is is that you know, we're trying to figure out things like how do you make a hardier wheat that can survive extreme heat or extreme cold? How do you make a hardier crop that can survive extreme drought? How do you make a crop that can supply greater nutritional content to places that typically have limited access to food? You know, right. we're, but, you know, and then on the other side of things is, is that, you know, if farmers themselves get kind of caught up in the whole anti-science rhetoric too, because sometimes, you know, it's, it's a matter of if you, you know, you've got an older generation who basically, you know, the extent of their knowledge was you, you put the seed in the ground, the seed pops up, you cut the seed down. <laughs> right. And, and, and the newer generations, <clears throat> you know, some of them have gone to school, you know, most of them have access to the internet. And so they're reading more about their crops. They're getting more involved in soil science. They're getting more involved in crop science. So that way they understand what it is they're putting in the ground and how are they going to effectively harvest you know, the food or the, the, the grain that's going to become next year's crop or next year's meal. Mm. And so you're, you're seeing that shift. It's just lagging behind. Right. And on top of that, when you look at some of these other, when you look at some of these other things that are happening, like for example, the whole cow is farting thing. Yeah, of course, <laughs> of course, you know, fucking ranchers feel attacked by it. But when you start reading about how, you know, by, you know, changing the feed structure of what cows get you know so number one they're still getting the nutrition that they need to bulk up and mm. you know su supply a, a solid beef but at the same time reduce their methane production yeah you know it's it's one of those things where you know as someone who grew up on a ranch and somebody who's also interested in science this stuff is really interesting to me because yeah, yeah. you know realistically 
you know, when you look at the, when you look at the study and it says, you know, by adding, you know, kelp into, you know, the mix, it helps reduce the methane that cows put out. Hey, great. You know what? In, in, in places where, you know, methane production is, is high, like dairy farms, for example, um, typically get a really bad rap on this, you know, great. Uh, or feedlots. Great. You know, the more that you can figure out the better. And, also, too, you know, if there are additional benefits to changing that diet, you know, if the cows are, you know, less gassy, if they're, you know, if they put on better weight, I mean, even down to like, if the quality of the manure that you get out of it actually right. provides a higher nitrogen content or a higher green, a green matter content that will, you know, better, you know, because a lot of people use that to fertilize, you know, to put green mm -hmm. matter into their, into their soil fantastic you know but the thing is is that oftentimes that science just doesn't have the same speed as you know sciences in all these other industries because yeah. it's not looked at as critical as as some of these other things and 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 i would say that it's just as critical uh simply because you know if if you don't eat you'll find the population un unrest very quickly and yeah. if you don't have you know if you don't have the adequate supply line in order to make sure that your crop is getting harvested if you don't have adequate diversification in order to make sure that your crop is getting harvested and you know uh, yeah farmers are going to feel attacked and farmers are going to feel like they're put on the spot for something that they realistically can't change they really can't hmm. you know you think about it it's like they have to put the crop in the ground somehow if all of your options are just diesel tractors there's that's no you hybrid do. you you don't that's like that's like going up to a person who can never afford a car and saying well why don't you drive an electric car it's right. like motherfucker i can't even get a fucking regular car let alone yeah. an electric car i got the old fucking two you know the old fucking shanks mare you well, know I, I couldn't help but think when you were talking about that that a harvester, let's say, cost a hundred thousand dollars. Now to upgrade to an electric, if they designed one, you know, an an, an efficient one, that would still cost a hundred thousand dollars or more. And I don't know farmers that can actually set that aside in in these days. And since I've been alive, to set that money aside so that they can invest in upgrades like that, you know. So how are they going to do it when they can't? They can't afford it. They don't make. They're not there to make a profit like, you know, uh, Amazon, you know what I mean? Farmers are right. there. Their food is priced on a national global scale and they, it can't be fluctuated like that. You know, you can't reduce your prices, but then keep your prices up for some reason with farm. I feel really bad for farmers. And, and I think that's one of the things that, you know, when you, what, what most people don't think about is, is that, you know, <clears throat> it's one of the few industries where, you know, you're at, you're literally at, you know, the mercy of mother nature most mm -hmm. of the time. And, and unfortunately you're also at the mercy of the industries that produce your equipment. Yeah. So if, if your industry that produces your equipment decides to jack up the prices on new things without supplying you anything, you know, much more advanced. Right. Yeah. It becomes a significant problem. Now, yeah. as you know, as someone who came from a, a farm that, you know, went from old technology, 70s and 80s technology to where, you know, we're probably about, I would say, you know, a good average about five years behind the curve on our technology. You know, oftentimes we're, you know, we're trading up into technology that's about five years old. Yeah, you know, for us, it has absolutely made a difference. But we also, it also took us a long time to get there yeah. and we had to ch do some substantial pr uh, practice changes in order to get there. And, you know, we've been lucky enough that there've been, you know, some favorable crop harvests and some favorable prices in order to make those changes. Because oftentimes, you know, you look at it, you got farms that are, you know, barely making it, you know, I mean, that right. was us for, that was us for a decade, yeah. you know, the family you know, farm is under attack because only big agriculture can afford that equipment that we're talking about, you know? 
Exactly. And, and so that's been all, that's always been one of the biggest issues is, is that you look at, you look at a lot of these uh, programs that, you know, help corporate farms, you don't have the same for small farms. And even if you are incorporated, it still doesn't give you the same level of advantage as it does give you some of the larger farms. Like, there are very few incentives, you know, I, and I honestly can't think of any um, in the farming industry that help, you know, like right now, for example, you know, there's a bunch of incentives that are going to be put out for, you know, people to buy electric cars. Right. There are no incentives like that for people to buy diesel electric combines. No. No. And if, and, they're, and, they're, if they're equal, then we should do something about that. Uh, you know, and that's, and that's one of the biggest, and that's one of those issues that you just have to realize in all of this is, is that, you know, there isn't the same level of look and care for the average American farmer. And, you know, part of that can be, you know, I would say part of it is politics and part of it is um, just, you know, industry lobbying and, and, and industry in general, Yeah. you know, if the industry doesn't have anything to lobby, then, well, obviously they're not going to you know, try and do anything like that. But, you know, now if you're seeing that push towards diesel electric in order to get higher fuel efficiency, in order to get, you know, greater harvests, in order to get, you know, more time out in the field and, and yeah. Yeah, cover yeah. more land, you know, you'd think that the industry, number one, would be willing to try and get some of that, you know, incentive out there for the average American farmer, in which case, you know, I really don't know if they're doing that or not. Uh, but that's a good question yeah i'm thinking of like smaller combines with like solar power like autonomous just they start with the sun and they just harvest you know there's the like amount the, of the amount a... of energy that it takes to power those things at this point you're yeah. like you're you're honestly you would be better off with a fucking nuclear a miniature nuclear reactor on those yeah. things. because okay. you know you, you, most people don't think about how much power it takes to you know power uh, a piece of equipment like that it yeah. it isn't you know even you know even at today's technology you would have to have you know a significant amount of solar po solar power up on your roof in order to generate enough kilowatt hours in order to you know charge your electric vehicle that's true and the amount of power that it takes in order to push a combine is so much greater than that mm. yeah you know, and like that's cutting the grass when it's wet and tall right yeah oh jesus and that's why it's one of those things where like there were sensible steps that could have been taken in order to get us there. But mm. I feel like everybody jumped flat over into, it just has to be electric rather than, right. rather than sit down and go, look, we know that, you know, the diesel electric industry works really well and has created some amazingly strong and efficient machinery. Why are we not pushing that in part of, you know, you know, the push towards electric vehicles, because at some yeah. point, at some point, they're going to perfect hydrogen lines, you know, liquid hydrogen as wow, your combustion yeah. source. And if you have, you know, uh, a source like liquid hydrogen that can power a battery that, you know, literally, you just have water and water vapor, you have all of the mechanisms there, you have all of the development there. It's just that now you have you know this greatly fuel efficient source yeah i like that and it, but everybody went straight from it you know we got to go from nothing that you know, everything that just mm -hmm. runs on gas or runs on diesel to it just has to be electric yeah without really thinking about the fact that you have to upgrade the infrastructure that supplies that power first in order to get to that car. And you saw that with California on the 24th, they're like, we're phasing out all the purchase of all combustion vehicles. Yeah. By 2035. Uh, yeah. And by 2035, but then six days later, ask people to not plug in their electric cars because the infrastructure take, you know, yeah. was, was taking a hit. And, and when you don't think about those things, you look really fucking dumb. <laughs> and that's the problem is, is that all of this could have been averted mm. had people thought, you know, it, it's, it's that trap of we need great change without recognizing the significant benefits of incremental change. The baby steps it takes to get to change. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because sometimes what you end up learning is, is that there's a technology along the way that bridges the gap and it gets you towards that quote unquote net zero. Mm-hmm. But 
what happens then is, is that when a different technology gets perfected, you can replace one technology with another technology, but your base stays the same. So like I said, you know, if you're using a diesel, a diesel engine in order to generate power for a battery and that battery yeah. is what's driving your vehicle, then what happens is, is that you already have this base understanding, this base platform. And when hydrogen combustion becomes more and more feasible, you are not having to reinvent a system of, you know, how am I going to get, you know, hydrogen from one place to the other? Mm -hmm. You already have, you already have this technology that will allow you to sit down and go, okay, this person can power their electric vehicle with a hydrogen engine. Uh, they can plug in their vehicle right. when they need to. And you have, you have diversification. And so that's just one of those things where people have, sometimes you miss great opportunities mm. by just trying to jump to a conclusion. And even yeah. if that conclusion, you know, I'm not saying that, you know, going strictly electric is the wrong conclusion. I think it could be the right conclusion, but I think that in order for it to be the right conclusion, that there are certain things that are not being addressed, like the, up, the upgraded infrastructure, like the, uh, like the, significant problems the significant unwillingness to even consider nuclear energy as part of that solution mm. i think half the diesel for now is better than all the diesel until no diesel later you know exactly that's what i'm thinking and, you know and, and that's the thing is like you know if you look at you know semis tractor trailers and you if you were to power them in a diesel electric manner mm -hmm. i think you honestly you would find yourself with a lot of a lot better uh, a lot better fuel efficiency realistically because it's um, uh, you know especially if you think about it you know right now it's like you have all of this physical exertion on the drive tires but what if you could legitimately take that diesel power like a series of electric motors that yeah, number one yeah. are just on the entire tractor and number two there's even there I, i've even seen a couple of tests out there where they're trying to put electric motors on trailers too and so you end up running that power back there and so now you have multiple drive tires right that's and cool. so it's it's like it's a combination pull and push at the same time and you know i think that you know there were opportunities out there that you know people are missing simply because they're like no it just has to be electric yeah, but I think the rest of the country, I think there's 7 billion people working on all these problems and they're coming up with solutions, you know, and I love that. I do have a question that I didn't think I was going to ask you because it's one of those agriculture questions. Yeah. Like, so I don't know if you know what 30 by 30 is. There's a, an initiative Biden put out called America the Beautiful Initiative. It's about land conservation that we want 30%. We're going to pay farmers. I don't know if you know about this, like that we're going to pay farmers to conserve their land. And I think that's kind of cool. But there was a governor, Governor Rick Ricketts, that said this was a land grab. This was a federal land grab. And um, I don't think even farmers in the discussions that I heard believe that. It's one of the most bipartisan issues out there that farmers actually want to conserve the land they have and they don't mind getting paid to do that do you know anything about that uh it's it's loosely based off of what's called uh crp 50 by um, 50 the, con the conservation reserve program okay and the idea the idea was is that you know farmers got paid to you know put land into conservation you know what it does is that you know you, yeah you have a bunch of land that's not being farmed that's you know on one side of things like if you want to think about the fuel side of things there's you know that's less fuel that's being expended in order to okay. uh in order to you know harvest crops plant crops spray but crops, it's to leave the it's to leave the land alone not to harvest it but just to Correct. not harvest it okay essentially essentially what you do is so with crp what you do is you you plant a bunch of native crops, uh, not crops, native, uh, what well, we call plants, crops, right, but right. plants, you know, things, you know, things that would grow naturally in, in the area. So grasses okay. and right. shrubs, scrubs, things Alfalfas, like that. buckwheats, yep. things like that. Yeah. Things that, you know, number one game fed on number two was native to the ground. Number three, I, I mean, it's, it's in, in a lot of ways, it's a great program because they're, you know, especially for us, like, there was a while where like a bunch of the crops a bunch of the farmland that was around our house we'd put into crp mm -hmm. and 
and a few years after it had been in CRP, we had significant amounts of game in our fields out there, which was great for me as a hunter. I love yeah. that. Uh, but at the same time, too, you know, a lot of the times what, you know, really what CRP was meant to target, though, was uh, ground that wasn't particularly fertile. And so, like, as a farmer, you end up running into this issue of, you know, when the price is good, you need to grow more crop. Mm -hmm. but when the price is bad, you need to grow more crop. And so you end up farming these areas that are not particularly great farmland. And okay. there's, there's a few places out there that we farmed where I was like, Jesus Christ, we're literally planting in rocks. What the fuck is happening here? And, and so by putting, you know, your farmland into a crop reserve, it, you got paid to have that land in there. It wasn't really a whole lot, but it was, wasn't, you know, nothing. Right. Um, but at the same time, you know, it, it, you know, there were, there were certain things you could and couldn't do with it. Okay. So like, for example, when we ran cattle, you could only harvest, I want to say it was about a third. I want it was either a half or a third of each particular field that you put into CRP in order to turn it into like hay for cattle. Okay. Now that to me was kind of problematic in that, you know, you could have easily allowed most of that to be harvested. Um, you could have just put a one time, like you can only be harvested once a season. Yeah. Um, something we cut our grass every week. Certainly you can harvest a field if you want. Right. Well, and that's the other thing too, is, is that, you know, with, a, with CRP, it's like, you're not, you're, you're not irrigating this stuff. It's, mm. You know, it's so legitimately most of the time, you know, unless you end up with a white year, you're only getting one crop off of that one hand right. crop off of that. And so, uh, and I think there were some other rules, like you couldn't, uh, like you couldn't sell it. So like, for example, um, I couldn't sell it, but I could um, have my uncle come out and cut it and heart, you know, cut it and bail it himself and take it off. Okay. Now, you know, and that's the thing is, is that, you know, I'm, it's there. Uh, what do I, how do I put this? Um, farmers find ways. You know, so for yeah. example, you know, you know, there was no rule that said, you know, yeah, you know, somebody couldn't, you know, you couldn't have someone come out and cut the grass and I get, you know, like a whole beef out of the deal. Right. You know, uh, you know, it, it, there were, there are ways, there are yeah. ways. And the more and, input, the more input agriculture has on these bills, the better they become, the more tailored they become. But it's, it's not, a, it's not a federal land grab, right? It's not the government saying, we're going to take your land and tell you what to do with it. Well, it's kind of like it saying, is here's in the, a way. but it's saying, here's the plan. If you want to use it, you don't even have right. to use it. No, no. It's, if you, it's, it's one of those things like you have to sign up for it. You have to jump through the hoops, but if you sign up for it, then yeah, you have to do, you yeah, have to course. follow what they're going to do. And, and, and so that's the issue there is, is that, you know, you don't have to put your land in the CRP, but if you do, there's a long list of rules that you have to follow. Well, and... that's like with everything, right? I mean, I'm on social security. There's a whole long list of rules that I have for my disability and I can yeah, choose not to have it. You know, <laughs> Right. And that's, and that's always the, that's always the dilemma is, is yeah, that, yeah. you know, I, I, somebody can pay you to do something specific with your land, but that also means that you have to follow the rules because that's why you're getting paid. Um, so for me, it's like, I see shit like that and I go, oh, for fuck's sake, it's, 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 it's no different than when people sign up for Facebook and then they're all surprised that all their data is being sold to, you know, a thousand different marketing companies. It's like, of mm. course it is. It's, you know, when you signed up for something, here was the cost of it. Yeah, if you sign up free, for, right? if you sign up for something like this, you get paid. Yes. But the cost is you get told what to do with your land, mm -hmm. you know, some and of it, not all of it, some not, of it. The the land that you put in. Right, right, right. And and that's and some people don't like that. I'm like, well, you're not getting money for nothing. That's the that's the whole deal of this. And number two, you know, with you know, with some of those rules, some of them never made sense. Like the whole like you could only crop, you could only you could only like harvest half of it. Right. Uh, you know, for for cattle. That didn't make any fucking sense. Well, maybe you should put John Tester on that committee, you know, instead of Matt Gates. But, like <laughs> I mean, right. I mean Tester's a Tester's a farmer. He would know. Right. You know? 
exactly you know exactly that and and that's the thing is is that with with those programs you know a lot of them were made and they didn't make some of them didn't make fucking sense at all that's the government though exactly and and so it's it's one of those things where it's like what really needs to happen is is that you know it needs to be in the hands of somebody like tester in the hands of uh somebody like um oh shit who was i thinking of there was another farmer that was on there, Republican. Um, hmm. Can't remember it. That's but, fine. you know, have people, you know, have have them go to their constituents and say, hey, here's what we're thinking in terms of a bill. Right. Does this make sense, you know, for your farming practices? You know, because that's one of those things, like, oftentimes it's like you get a bunch of people who aren't involved in agriculture and they make a bunch of rules. But then if you had somebody like Tester on there, he would go like, what the fuck is this? This is right. dumb. Right. Put the bill up on Facebook and then read the comments and hear where it makes sense and hear where farmers are like, that doesn't, you know, like there has to be more per, per people input instead of po politics. <clears throat> but I think we ignored politics for so long and just put that on autopilot. We never thought that we, we needed to have an input, you know, we just well, elected biggest... smart people, but we need to customize the settings with input you know well the other problem is is that you end up with a bunch of people who aren't farmers putting their input in because right. they see themselves as conservationists but they're really not <clears throat> uh, okay. i would say any good farmer is a conservationist you know they want to take care of their land they yeah. you know and 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 you see this more typically in small farms because they recognize that you know if they don't take care of their land there's not going to be another crop and if they, right. if there's not another crop they're never going to be able to, you know, keep their life in the countryside. <clears throat> Plus so, you, you end up with a dust bowl theory all over again. You know, that's all, and, that's the last time that we didn't do this land con conservation thing. Well, and then on top of that, what you end up with is, is that you have, you have these organizations that want all of these different rules in mm. and some of them do benefit wildlife yes absolutely not going to deny that but there's a lot of rules out there that are strictly meant to keep people from keeping land productive it's what you've right. seen for example in forestry um and why you're starting to see so many huge wildfires it's not just the fact that there's climate change it's that there's also been a systematic lobbying of don't touch anything right and then they're shock and surprise when these old forests burn to the fucking ground and they burn hotter and they fucking make the hillside barren because there's too much fuel on the ground mm -hmm. and these fires burn even hotter than they would because they've hey haven't burned uh in a cycle that they should have been burning right and, or, plus, and they plus... weren't thinned because we've you know managed to restrict timber harvests to right. insane levels and we build infrastructure right above it i mean electric lines are running right above this stuff all it takes is a lightning strike or a spark and california's burning you know i have friends that have dealt with that and right. everybody laughed at trump when he was like we need to rake the forests and now there's a new theory of putting goats in there just to let them eat this stuff and i love the fact that we have the room to imagine tangents of imagination like imagine the most ridiculous extreme thing and then work back instead of saying what's the most pragmatic thing and how little can we inch forward you know well and that's the thing is, is that there are there are absolutely ways in which you can take something like conservation mm -hmm. and bring in a lot of input yeah. and make sense you know for example yeah you've got you know you've got you know i would say the people who you know want to see you know things return more pristine and yeah you want to be able to have safe spaces for endangered species absolutely not going to disagree with that but then you also have people who you know recognize that you know if you don't do timber harvests you know we're we're a population that needs a lot of wood right and and you know I would argue that wood prices are artificially high because you've had all of these issues with being able to harvest for a long fucking time. But then you also have the firefighters who've had to go in and fight all of these fires and they can tell you exactly what they're up against when mm -hmm. they have to go into these wildfires. And then you also have people who are climate specialists who understand like how do you, you know, at what point does a forest it's most productive in producing oxygen and pulling in carbon dioxide? Like there are ways in which you could make this 
much more effective. Yeah. But unfortunately, people tend to swing towards a loud voice, cut down all the trees. No, preserve all the trees, don't allow any timber harvesting. Yeah. And people who are like, no, look, I have to deal with this. This is bullshit. Uh -huh. <laughs> I like what Tallahassee does is it sets aside a uh, forest and they plant trees and then they cut trees and then they cut trees and then they plant trees. So there's always a continuing Mm -hmm. harvest right there and bamboo is a real real idea you know like we we your toilet paper is manufactured less than 500 miles from you and they need the trees that's what they're using it for you know and so mm -hmm. we need to allow them to pick the right trees instead of just these trees because forests are burning because they're not tended to while this this land in florida right here is tended to all the time and has no no fires you know and that's where and that's where you're starting to see more concepts of the quote unquote working forest yeah you know places yeah. places that have had input of you know how do we help preserve wildlife how do we help preserve industry how do we help prevent wildlife collapse how do we help prevent forest fires right and you know and that's the thing is it's like there is a way to do it but once again, it requires people to go from I'm going to get my way and my way only to mm -hmm. we think we have the best solution. Let's test this out. Right. And, see and that, tweak it as we need. And I say it, I think I say it every week now. I don't want Joe Biden coming up with these solutions. I want oh. I want the people in the trenches making these decisions, making these suggestions, not people that watch people struggle in the trenches. And the other thing I want to say about this is that the media focuses so much on Donald Trump. He takes so much oxygen. If you removed him from the scene and didn't talk to him, we might eventually get to a media that discusses things like this, you know, and yep. informs other people. And that's my problem with the mainstream media. I just watched a week of Donald Trump, Donald Trump, Donald Trump, and never learned if the if the inspectors made it to Zaporizhia, right? Like, right. I don't know what's going in in Palestine anymore. I nobody's focused on Jacksonville, and that just it just pisses me off so bad sometimes. It's it's real frustrating because there really is there really are so many different options and opportunities out there in order to make things better. Yeah. But there's just no focus on actually doing that. It's, right. it's all like, just about whatever garbage people want to push today. Right. But there's millions of people that are concerned with our agriculture industry, millions of them. And they all have an opinion on this. The problem is, is nobody's given them a megaphone to be like, Hey, think about us. You know, <laughs> And that's and that's absolutely part of the problem is is that you have people who have just you know farmers and ranchers who feel like they've just been either either forgotten or shunned right by everybody despite the fact that if they don't exist you don't fucking eat like I don't know right. people really fully grasp that I mean you there are uh, there are a group of people out there who sit down and say shit like I don't know why we're giving you know all these ranchers subsidies or this that or the other I mean I just go buy my meat at the grocery store uh -huh. the fuck do you think they come from it doesn't right. it's not lab made at this point not yet and if you want to go vegan or vegetarian, we need the, we need the food. You'll need to farmers that. for that. <laughs> right. Absolutely. Right. I mean, all these plant based meats, they got to come from some plant. And I think about like the airline industry or NASA. I can think of a ton of other industries that pollute the atmosphere that, that you wouldn't even think about, you know? And so agriculture. I don't, I don't want them to feel like they're being blamed. I really appreciate them. All I want to do is create more local farms, smaller local farms, so I can go to the farm myself and say, I want to buy this. You know what I mean? I want, to, yeah. I want them to know what they can expect so they can harvest it. I want, I want a pound of potatoes every month. Hey, guess what? We have 50 customers that want a pound of potatoes. We now know what to grow this year. You know? <laughs> Or, you know, it's like, this is what I can grow on this land. I mean, that's the thing is like, most people don't right. know what a land is capable of growing, but a farmer does. Right. Like, you, if you come out to, if you come out to my area and you're like, Hey, I want a pound of potatoes. I'm going to laugh at you and tell you yeah. pound sand. Yeah. You can't go uh, to Indiana and get carrots, right? Because <laughs> I can't, I can't grow potatoes on my land. 
Right. But I, I, I can I can grow wheat, I can grow durum, I can grow garbanzo beans, I can mm. grow flax, I can grow canola, like I can I can grow barley. Like there's a bunch of different things I can do. I but... love all of that. That is all in my dietary wheelhouse, by the way. <clears throat> and and so, you know, it's you know, being able to sit down and know where you can go. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. But at the same time too, you know, that's why we also have, you know, having more community options. Like hey this is where everything comes this is where everything gets milled have like all these different little centers where you could you know have local grains milled for you i agree i think we need to get kids more into the process of the supply chain like mm -hmm. the shorter supply chain so the kid knows a lot of inner city kids don't know what a piece of lettuce looks like you know unless it's on a mcdonald's burger and I think that needs to change. And I liked our 3D garden idea. And I like the community farm idea. I really do. I like farm to table so much. I really do. And that's the thing is, is like there, there are definitely ways and there are definitely options out there. Yeah. And it's, it's one of those things where people need to be able to understand that this stuff, it's, it's not, it's not easy to do. Mm. but once you get it moving in the right direction it becomes a lot easier mm. and it requires a lot of understanding it requires science it requires you know people that are committed to the idea of growing food to the idea of conservation to the idea of caring for land and unfortunately a lot of people tend to think that oh you know farmers don't care about the land no we really do trust me we really do we we know what barren fields look like and it's a bad day i don't know anybody that would care about the land more than a farmer except maybe a park ranger or a food and wildlife guy you know and even then you know one of the you know and and it's you know does the farmer really not care about the land or is it that they just have never had the opportunity to understand what their land could be doing if they embraced sciences or you know it, with the newer generation most of them are more in tune with it than ever before yeah well you they know, spend that's... 24 hours a day on the land they're not in some office going harvest it harry you know what i mean well you you have you have the ability to do things now that you never did you know for example back in 2014 i was helping a buddy of mine by trying to show him how he could do solar irrigation for his hay crops nice. and show him how he, that was easy enough to do and that if he did it right he could probably actually supply power to his house mm. you know and that there are ways to do this sure. and 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 you know he called me he's like i thought you were smoking something and, <laughs> and now about 10 years later he's like you remember that conversation we had 10 years ago where i told you i thought you were high i said yeah and he goes i was wrong you were just way ahead of your time. I'm like, mm. yeah. That's why I, I love you. You imagine and you're pragmatic. You know, I like that. It's it's one of those things where I see the direction things are going. Mm -hmm. And and I can appreciate the direction that it is going. But I'm also realistic. Right. You know, that some of this stuff isn't going to change the way that you want it to. No matter how much you want it to. Uh, is, but not there as quickly, are, that's for sure. Not as quickly. But there are realistic ways in order to do it, mm -hmm. and and it's it's so possible to do. Do you think twenty years ago we we would have even thought about Detroit City as the electric motor city? You know what I mean? No, no, don't think we would have. That's so. But I also don't think we would have. I don't also don't think we would have thought of Detroit just turning into what it is <laughs> right now. I don't. I don't think the citizens of Detroit would have thought that suddenly they would find themselves living in a place that, you know, was once like a pride and joy of American mm -hmm. manufacturing is now, you know, just a sad and vacant reminder of, you know, an era gone by yeah. when it really never needed to be that way. You know, it's, it doesn't need to continue to be that way. But I also understand too that, you know, it's real hard to invest in infrastructure in a place that, you know, doesn't exactly, you know, isn't exactly up on the standards. Again. I, I really do think Detroit could be a beautiful place again to produce cars. I really do. I think it will be. I do. I think it's the importance of what we're doing. We just need people to get on board with the fact that electric is here. Corporations are doing it and there's bills that are funding it, right? And we just need right. to, we need to, and that's the problem, Jeffrey, is Democrats are throwing money at the wall and Republicans are like, no, don't do that. But nobody's like, 
hey, let's let's think about where the money's going. <laughs> like, you know, like maybe mm -hmm. we needed a little less here and a little more here. Like, I know this is way off the tangent. We're towards the end, but Ted Cruz is actually fighting the student debt elimination idea that Joe Biden had. And I, ten thousand dollars, twenty thousand for a Pell Grant. I think that's within reason for for the president to do. And I think if Congress thinks it's not enough, they should do more. And if they think it's too much, then they should do they should do less. But I don't think one guy should be like fighting this. I, I thought it was a good idea, you know? I think it's a great idea. Do I think it's enough? No, I, I think that no, eventually they're going not. to get, I think eventually what's going to happen is, is they'll get it fine tuned just right. But the biggest problem was always that it, the the servicing of these loans had required independent servicers mm -hmm. and those independent servicers have to run a profit of course it's the and system so, stupid right <laughs> exactly and so to me that was one of the biggest failings of it is is that of course i understand like you know i understand that you know it, it wouldn't matter if it was an independent loan servicer or if it was a federal a federal uh, mm -hmm. branch but i can what i can say is is that when you know the feds have to get their percentage and then a private industry has to get their percentage that's going to make it more expensive in the long term yeah whereas if the feds had said you know here's the percentage that we're going to get and then here's a little bit of markup so that way we can pay for systems etc 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 exactly and that's really what needed to happen is it would be cheaper overall mm -hmm. and you would still have a, a significant number of employees but those companies are not there to just make a baseline and just get money back to the feds. They if have you to keep someone in, if you keep someone in debt for 30 years, you get payments for 30 years. And if you have a million people that are doing that, you're making a profit. Right. But what I think is important is that Joe Biden was like, I'll do this. But if you want more, you got to do that as Congress. Like, you know what I mean? He didn't mm -hmm. try. He didn't try and omnibus the system. He just did what he thought he could do. And I appreciate the restraint on that because Democrats are usually like, we're going to take care of everything. And then it's the no, yes, no. I want Republicans to be like, this is what I didn't like about it, but here's what I would like if you did. Would I you... wish they were involved more like that instead of just going to court and saying uh, a taxpayer has been aggrieved because of this, you know? I think I think one of the things that Republicans, you know, if if they were wise, what they would do is say, all right, we'll forgive student loan debt, but we're getting out of it entirely. Yes, right. And the federal government will not do, you know, student loans anymore. I would love Whereas, that. But we will know, regulate and oversee them. <laughs> in which case, you know, the federal government could absolutely do that and, yeah. and say that student loans can only have X number percentage repayment terms could be. Yeah, you could absolutely do that. And that yeah. could absolutely be what the student loan industry becomes. Yeah. I could also see Democrats saying, look, you know what, we've, you know, we we're going to fund universities because, mm -hmm. I mean, Biden called it out correctly that the cost of college has skyrocketed that a Pell Grant used to cover 80% of, uh, of a student's time at school and now right. covers less than 30. Absolutely. I, I mean, I watched that happen to me. Mm -hmm. So, but it, the, but it is the system. It's just not, it's Congress's role to work on that. That's not right. the president to uniquely design uh, a, a, a system. He's not there to retool the system for, for loans, you know, and I, I don't want him to do that. <laughs> right. So, so that's, so I would say that that's where, that's where things are with that is, is that yeah. you could absolutely figure out a better student loan industry than what's out there now. And I think Agreed. it's going to be incumbent upon Republicans and Democrats to figure out what that is Yeah. and, and whether it's the government gets out of it entirely, but regulates it or it becomes solely a government function and mm. you know you take you take socialism. private industry out of it you know whether well, whether it's socialism or whether it's you know the government funds it and you now instead of having you know these different companies that service it now it's just right. a federal branch that services it much like the irs I, i'm okay with that too i just think that the interest rates have to be zero or like minimal marginal and so it's, i would say minimal marginal simply because you you do want to take you do want to get money into the system in order to grow the opportunity for others to go to school oh, correct i agree with that yeah but but you know the the lack of fixed rates the lack of 
you know, all of that fun stuff. That is, yeah. that really makes things difficult. Agreed. All right. I appreciate you being here, Jeffrey. I want to let everybody know that this Thursday, we're going to have a special episode with my friend, Patrick uh, Kessel, Kessel, Fuck, I had it until just now. <laughs> but you'll find it in the description portion of Thursday's episode. He uh, He's an alcoholic. He went into recovery. He started the 12-step program, and we got some really great information about that. So that's going to be Thursday's episode. And I always want to let people know, give your co-host a break when you can. You know what I mean? I'm going to start working on clip shows so that next time Jeffrey needs some time off, I'll have some episodes there too because I always want you to feel... Like, this is fun and not work. But I do appreciate you being here. Oh, yeah. Is there anything you wanted to uh, wrap up on? No, I'm good. I'm probably going to go find out if my Xbox, the the one that I just fixed, <laughs> if it <laughs> took a shit. <laughs> Does it stop working last night? All right. And then next Sunday, we're going to have Dan on. He's got a new company, and we're going to talk about that. And just the title is a little bit over my head. So. <laughs> It's going to be fun. I am so excited because I wish only the best for, for Dan. But thank you for being here, Jeffrey, and I will see you next week. <laughs>